Okay, I'm turning the mics on here. Um, wrong one. Okay. So make sure I got my whiteboard set up here. Jeff's on his way in. You guys hear me okay? So everybody can hear me okay? Uh, say something in chat and all right, cool. Um, so we're going to be talking up here. Jeff's going to wipe down the board. <laughs> he wants a clean board, so we're going to have a clean board. Let me get, I could probably get a little bit bigger. That's fine. That's fine. That'll work. That'll work. Now, so we can see your chats up here, a little bit of an echo. I can turn one of the mics off. Is what if I turn this mic off? Is that, is that, so we're live right now. We're just, I'm just telling okay. them we're setting it up. I'm just going to try to make this board a little bit nicer. This is casual. We have 15 viewers right now. All right. Nice. Wow. So I can watch the board. Um, so so the, the point is that we're going to, I wanted to talk to Jeff about cortical columns actually in preparation for my AI chat, neuroscience chat next week. And he's, he knows a lot about this. <laughs> so you to talk about layers. Or layers in, in cortical columns, yeah. Especially like, I'm, I'm certainly interested in sort of the two loops, you know, the, the two, uh, uh, the two the sensory motor things. Yeah, the two sensory yeah. motor things. Uh, I think that would be something yeah. fun. Yeah, while we don't understand all that stuff, it has some loops. Yeah. Do I have to worry about the sound on this? Uh, um, is everybody here, Jeff, OK? Facing the board. He's facing the board. You know what I'm saying? I could also, uh, I've been working on, we could, whoops, move this mic too. If it helps, we can have this mic right here. All right. It's a bit quiet. Okay, let me, I'll try a different mic. Okay, how about, now we have a different mic. Right, Does that mic sound better? Board now, can we, if I face the board, can you hear that? Is it right here, Jeff? Oh. I changed mics. <laughs> better. Okay, better. All right. So, all right. All right. Where Matt, do you you're going gonna to lead this discussion. Well, sure. I can draw the outline. So what I want to know. <laughs> well, don't put it right in the middle because that's what they're doing. Well, do whatever you want. What are you? Well, you, you what's the outline of what? what you the, the oh, 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 you're going to actually draw the cortical. I want to draw the cortical. Ah, ah. I want. I want to. I want to say. Okay. There's layer one, which we know is just white matter, right? Uh, not ac all right. Depends on how accurate you want to get here. Well, let's get it so it's relevant to HTM theory and, okay. and sensory motor right. theory, especially. I mean, from an, in the biology, there are actually cells in layer one, but most there's few of them, so people don't usually talk about it. Okay, so let's so we'll forget about it for right now. Okay, two, three. Should we draw them separately? Uh, well, or? I don't know. It depends on the questions you want to ask. <laughs> well, it's I not mean, part of the sensory motor loop, okay, so we don't have to separate them out if we're going to talk about um, object recognition. Yeah, or I, mean, I mean, we can make you can divide. There's two ways to think about this. What are the different cell populations, and yeah. um, and and defined by their morphology and their connectivity? And then there's layers. Yeah, layers are just like a rough guideline. It's like you know, there are more cell populations than there are layers. So within each layer, you can subdivide it, and some cell populations expand layers. So it's like the layers is more like a rough guide, and we talk about them as if they're really there. In some cases, they really are, but it's it's more of a yeah, this cell type is found in this layer. So often people look at layer two, three, and you don't see a demarcation within layer two, three. It looks right. like it physically looks like one layer, right. but then you some people can subdivide into two, and some people subdivide into three or four, and so then you can talk about layer three A, three B, and two versus. And so it really depends on. Well, maybe we should start with with our sensory motor theory and just talk about. Um, the, I can know. I can start with what are sort of the general big ideas that people talk about in columns, and okay. then we can divide that. All okay. right, let's do, let's do that. So let's do that. So if you look at if you look at you know what classically most people believe, and if you were to go and look in a textbook or our beginning book on neuroscience, that's a little skinny. Uh, is that camera on the wall? But you can do this. So I don't want to stand in front of this, right? Yeah. Let's well, see. So you can see over uh, over there exactly what they see. There's a wide view on the yeah, wall okay. in the corner right. there. So. so. So the general view goes like this, and then we can talk about exceptions. Okay. The general view is that the primary input layer is layer four. Right. And so we'll just put a four there. And that means that if you were, if you were getting something from the skin or from the eyes or from the ears, uh, and, the, and these are primary regions of the cortex, that the, the, those inputs would come into layer four. And I'll just, maybe I should draw that in a different color. Uh, I don't know. Um, Maybe green. Yeah, green. So here's you get some primary input into layer four, and uh, that's where that's where everything starts. Primary proximal to feed four. Well, okay, that's input. the second question. Uh -huh. Yes. So the cells here in layer four, that's a detail. 
I didn't want to get into the detail yet. The cells here in layer four, there are thousands of synapses on them. Look, maybe five to seven percent of the synapses come from this this input. Yeah. Or uh, our connector to this input, and they are proximal and they drive the cells. And ninety-five percent of the synapses on these cells come from elsewhere, and they're not driven. But let's let's not go there yet, okay? Five to seven percent. Yeah. So very small, yeah. less than ten percent. Yeah. The general view is the following: that information now goes in the following way. People say, oh, that this information flows up to uh, layers two, three. We'll just call them two, three. Most of this is what you'd see in most books. Yeah most introductory stuff. So it goes to layer two, three. So go four to layer two, three. Um, layer two, three actually is an output layer of the column. So you can think about, it, oh, already you've, you've, only, you've gone two steps and you've output something. Mm. But, um, but then the classic view is the following, that lay, layer uh, two, three also projects, I probably didn't draw this very well, to layer five. So now the information goes like this. It goes down to layer five. And, uh, and then layer six is sort of in the classic view. People, don't, they don't really think about it too much because it's so hard to look at. They didn't know what it did. So presumably it goes down to layer six. And another output of the column is layer five. Right. This is, and, 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 and then there's some other things going on. Uh, for example, it is uh, generally uh, assumed that there are these connections going back to layer, from five to layer two, see, but these seem to be non-drivers. They seem to be, you know things, that, and then there's and then there's other things. There's there's in, in layer six we can subdivide this into multiple layers because of cell types, right? Yeah, cell, cell types. And yeah, and so we might say there's layer six A and six B, and there's other cells in here. We get and one of the other things that is very well known is that there's a there's a, a, a major connection from from six A to four and from six B to five. Okay. The, uh, the, that's that's where I want to pull out now. Okay, all right, all right. So these are like classic things, but it's more complicated than this. Yeah. Um, and and uh, it just everything I just said here has complications. That is, there's <laughs> additional things that I didn't mention. Mm -hmm. right. So we we have focused on a couple things, just to give it a sense. We have focused in in some of our papers. We've talked about how these two layers here. Um, well, we, we, showed, we showed in our sequence memory paper, the paper that's like uh, grit, uh, widest neurons of thousands of synapses. Yeah. We basically modeled a single layer of cells. So in that paper, we'll call it the, uh, what we call it, the, the, the neuron. We call it here the neuron paper. That's the 2016 paper. Right. Um, that basically talks about one layer of cells for learning sequences. It's got input and learning sequences. We don't, I don't even know if we said that in that paper, but that was essentially is saying one of those places that could be occurring was layer four. One of them. We also think it's going on elsewhere too. So that was, that was like sequence memory. Then, um, then we did uh, the paper that came out a year and a half ago, which talked about how it was called, you know, uh, we call it the comms paper. Mm -hmm. That's like, um, it's a set, the first sensory motor paper. Yeah, and, and I'll, put, I'll put a link in there real quick. Go ahead and keep talking. So that's the first time we said, hey, in addition to sequences, there is you can you can do it, uh, you can do sensory motor inference or sensory motor prediction, and so that basically said uh, it was the first time we said okay you've got layer six a you've got layer four and you've got layer two three, so that was saying in that in that paper six a was representing a location, mm -hmm. and then um, and layer two three was representing sort of the object being recognized. Pooling layer. Uh, it's the pooling layer. Yeah. It's a spatial pooling, a temporal pooling layer. Right, temporal pooling. So let me just draw a little picture. So, so just to clarify, that means many columns would be in layer four. Well, uh, right. they might be everywhere, but the, the, we definitely okay. model them in layer four. Yes. Okay. So here's in this columns paper, we said, oh look, there's this back and forth between six a and four and projection to th two three. This. Um, uh, we use the same mechanism in layer four as in the neuron paper, so we have those mini columns you just referred to. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So layer four can learn sequences, and layer four, can, uh, uh, you know, like melodies, and layer four can also learn sensory motor sequences, like how things behave. Right. And so this was going to represent the location on the object. This is the, this is now going to represent uh, the input in a particular context. These things change as you move your finger or moves your eyes, but this thing was going to be stable because this was the object. Yeah. So we did we did this temple pooling layer here, meaning a stable representation here 
is mapped, is, it, all these different patterns down here are mapped to a single p pattern up here. So as you move your finger over an object or you move your eyes, these things are changing, but this is stable as long as you're on the same object. Right. And um, so that's, that was in the columns paper. We, inco we incorporated three of those. Um, and then in the, in the paper that, um, uh, the two papers that came, the one that came out in December, the, the framework paper, plus and, then and the framework, the Columns Plus has just came, it's not even, I don't think it's posted yet, it's the abstract is up there, it's yeah. accepted. Yeah. So we call that a Columns Plus um, and the framework paper, the framework paper is out there. Yeah. Um, what we did there is it's the same basics, uh, it's more than this, but we basically said, hey, layer 6A is not just location, uh, we're saying it's grid cells. Right. Um, and we talked a lot about how those grid cells work uh, and so on. So we've been sort of, up to now, we've been modeling three, uh, uh, sort of a three layers of, of many of these layers here. And we, we, there's a lot more that we haven't talked about yet in any of our papers and a lot more nuance on what we have here that we haven't discussed really publicly. Right. So, so now, we're, now we're starting to talk about, you know, what, what things that we talked about here. We also introduced in, um, in the frameworks paper, we introduced another idea uh, called the um, uh, displacement cells. And um, we speculated that those are in layer five. So actually there's sort of a, we've added in the frameworks paper, we added sort of another, uh, one of the layer five cells is sort of a speculating on what its role is. So layer five has different populations. Of layer five is generally divided in two. That is the general view in the world that there are this is one of the ones that is more clear that there are two layers, two different cell types in layer five. That's pretty clear. Is one of them associated with the output? Specifically? Uh, yes, one of them. Yeah. Is, one of them is associated with the output specifically. The other one is not. Okay. Uh, well, it's even more complicated than that. I don't know where you want to go with this, Matt. Um, <laughs> I just want to get a better understanding of it. Okay. Really right. sure. it, it's really complicated. So yeah. both of these cells, um, uh, both five A and five B. Uh, and there's a more precise way of defining them. They actually are both output cells. Um, so one of them is that what was it is generally viewed as the. Uh, you want me to go into it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just draw down here. Okay. Here's layer five. There's five A and five B. What's really confusing is that in some animals, what is called five A. In other animals, it's 5B. So, so rodents, it's flipped around from primates. Mm -hmm. So, the, so, <laughs> okay. so they, they go by different. There's another way of referring to them. Are the, the cell types are actually in different places? It, it's basically, they, imagine I have two different types of cells in, in layer 5. Yeah. And literally, they're in, in one animal. Some animals, one's on top of the other, and the other's on top of the other. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter, but you can't just call it 5A and 5B unless you right. specify the, the animal. Type. Yeah. So now people have started using the term uh, sometimes they use uh, layer five thick tufted, mm -hmm. and the other one is layer five thin tufted, which is pretty bad because they're both two T's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, Great. Right. But let's just, just not worry about it. Let's just, just talk about the two different cell types and what they do. Okay. One of these is, um, is, is it represents behaviors. It goes out of the cortex, and okay. it's, it's like a motor output. Okay. And every column, as far as we know, has these cells, and they project subcortically and to generate behavior. Right. So even the parts of like, the cortex are getting put in the eyes are, are, um, uh, are, are directing how the eyes to move. And so there's a part of the neocortex called motor cortex, which is really just the part that projects to your spinal cord. But every part seems to project someplace that does motor, even the auditory things turn your head, things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a motor output layer. Surprisingly, this same layer, these same cells, project to the next higher region in the cortex. So it's like, it's like you're sending a motor signal out here, but you're also sending something up to the, the higher levels of the cortex. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what that one cell type does. The what other, what but, layer does it go to in the higher uh, region? Well, the primarily layer four. Okay. Uh, oh, it's part, so part of the input. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, that, that, this is the main input. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're going all, but this is not a structured conversation. Yeah. Actually, when it does that, it goes through the thalamus. Yeah. So 
and, and we didn't mention that here, but the thalamus, everything, everything that comes from the sensory organs to the, to the cortex go through the thalamus, and when a, when a region of the cortex projects to a higher region from layer five to layer four, it also goes through the thalamus. So this is sort of like, this is parallel. The output of one column is sort of the, like the output of uh, your retina or your ear yeah. or something like that. So, so, so this region of the hierarchy and this one are both outputting motor commands Everything. As far simultaneously. As far every, as we every, know, every single. Yeah. Uh, and, and part of the thousand brains theory that we were promoting is that every column is a complete sensory motor system, right? Every column on its own is a right. complete sensory motor system. Right. So every column has input. Well, I shouldn't say sensory. Every column has an input. Every column has a motor output. Every column is building models of some part of the world based on its input and its motor output. And right. they're all doing this everywhere. So everywhere should have a motor output because uh, somehow it's impacting behavior in some way. Right. Um, so th that's one of these layers of layer five. The other layer five actually projects, um, it projects elsewhere. Um, and it's also an output layer. And let me just put it this way. One of the, it, it goes to all, it goes to other columns also. So let's call this 5A for the moment. Mm -hmm. The 5A would project to 5A and other columns elsewhere. It's more of a lateral connection. It's like 5A is connected to 5A everywhere, something like that. Oh, okay. So, so in addition, this is also a lateral connection. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there's uh, also it's, a 5 it's, lateral it's, connection. Here's the really weird thing about it is that the two major outputs, layer 2, 3, and the same, uh, well, uh, layer 5, they both can project laterally, like layer two, three, three cells can project to layer two, three cells. Yeah. And, they can, and layer five A cells can project to layer five A cells. Okay. Um, that's our voting concept that, we, that we've described in these papers. Uh -huh. um, but it's also, it, they also project hierarchically. So five A and layer two, three can project to layer four in the next region. Um, in the hierarchy, so it's both. Oh, okay. it's, it's both oh, lateral. Because okay. it's a part of the output of the column, it's, it's, it might want to be part of the input. It's really okay. complicated. One way to think about this, the way the way I've been thinking about it, is just try to understand what a column does on its own, and then you can ask why would I send some of these signals someplace and some of these signals other places, and you can understand that if you start by understanding exactly what a column does. Mm -hmm. So, if, a, if if layer two three is sort of representing an object, let's say. Well, I can share that with other layer two threes because it's an object. Yeah. And we can vote. We can say, you're thinking you're seeing the coffee cup. I think I'm seeing the coffee cup. We're seeing the coffee cup. Right. If, um, however, I can also take that object and it can become part of another composite object at another region. So I can say to you, you're, you're now, now I'm going to talk to your layer four and you're higher up in the cortex. Mm -hmm. I say, Matt, you're building a more composite object, the, the, the T set. And, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, not a very good analogy, but it's so sub I like, like tea. <laughs> okay, but you know, you're building a more composite object of which the coffee cup is part of that. Yeah. And so you might say, oh, that's my input to building an object of the one of the one of the components of that object is a coffee cup. Something that perhaps takes a broader sensory field of view to construct. Uh, either that, or it's, it doesn't even have to be a broader view. It just it could be. Usually it is, but more it's just it's a composite. Yeah. Um, it's to say that this thing is part of a larger thing. Yeah. And so, um, as you go, if you think about the cortex as a hierarchy, it's, it's then you're going to be building objects composed of objects composed of objects. If you think about it as, um, as a whole set of columns that are voting together, then they're all just trying to agree on what, what, they're, what they're seeing. No matter what level of hierarchy they're at. Yes. Um, so, so both of these types of connections can make sense. You can say layer 2, 3 projects to layer 2, 3 because we're voting, trying to decide. You and I are observing the same thing right now. We're trying to re reach a common consensus. Yeah. Or I might be passing layer 2, 3 to somebody else, layer 4, and they say, hey, that's my input. Now I'm trying to build a new object, which one of the components is the sub -up. Right. I know it's really weird, um, but that's... So, so, so this, this still really interests me, this, uh, this other output from layer 5, because this has to do with movement or time. Well, right? well, okay, that's, this was the movement one. Yes. One of these layer 5 cells, that's the thick tufted cells. Okay. Those are the one that assigns the movement. No one knows what these are, but I have speculated what they are. I mean, there's, there's, there's generally, if you talk to neuroscientists, they'll say, yes, layer 5A cells project broadly. They go all over the cortex to other, these are the thin tufted cells. Yeah. They have no idea what they're doing. But if they're doing something similar to this, wouldn't well, they be sort of we voting would, for yeah, we, what? We would argue that it's a voting. They're voting. Yeah. Whatever it is they're representing, they're voting. And that means other columns 
that this that this thing here, whatever this is, is going to be stable relative to the rest of the column. It's like it's just like the object is stable as you move your finger over it. Yeah. Um, well, could it perhaps rep be representing the sensor moving through space as a, as a stable object? Uh, as a stable. Uh, I don't know what it is. No. I don't know yet, but I mean, we can go we can go down this path because we think the system is. We're now working on the, the idea that we're expanding on what we've already published, and yeah. it's more complicated, and I can explain where we're going with that. But I don't know if I'm losing you or if you, are, if you want to get at something specific. Okay, so the specific thing that I'd like to get at is we've already talked about sort of the one sensory motor um, loop or circuit here. But within then, a column. Within a column. Yeah. But, but, and then we've talked about object composition as well. Yeah. The, the interesting thing that we're, I think we're still sort of trying to figure out is how that works when you're attending a parent versus a feature of a parent. Well, you know, uh, that is one thing, although I would rather steer in a different direction. Where do you want to steer? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you, you probably have a better perspective on I, what you know, I, I think I would, about I, might have, I have an interesting perspective, but I, you know, it's obviously Sorry. there's a lot of stuff we don't know. I actually think yeah. there's two circuits like this going on. Are we okay there? We're good, we're good. I think this, this, this basic idea that you have movement Input stability, right? Yeah. Movement. This is like some sort of movement location representation. You have some sort of input where you're now saying, okay, this input in this context, and now I can learn a st stable representation by in by temporal pooling over that. I think there's two of these going on in each column. Yeah. So let me just redraw this picture of you, if I might. If yes, I might. please. That's this is what I wanted to yeah. get to. You probably have a better way of defining. I don't know. Don't say that. that <laughs> Uh, let's think about it this way. Correct. Um, here's a column. Here's one of those circuits. Okay, one of those circuits involves three layers. 6A, and then uh, to 4, and 4 to 2, 3. Yeah, which okay. is exactly that. Which is exactly this. Yeah. That's one of these circuits. Yeah. Now, in the same column, there's another one of these circuits going on. So I'm just going to draw it next to this so I don't confuse this picture too much. But okay. it's in here, right. right? In the same column, there appears to be something like 6B to layer 5. And it's not clear which of these layer 5s it is yet. But the same feed forward feedback. Yeah, I'll tell you why. There. I'll tell you why. There's a very these six A cells have a characteristic look to them. They're very they're kind of unusual the way they're uh, the way their the dendritic trees look mm -hmm. and how they make projections like projections layer four. I can go into that if you want to go into that, but they're kind of unique, and so you can kind of identify them. They're like, oh yeah, that's those cells. They look different. Okay. Six B cells look very similar. And they have the same, so and these six A cells have this bi-directional connectivity to layer four, and these six B cells have this bi-directional connectivity to layer five. Yeah. And this is suggestive. It says, hmm, wow, I wonder if something like this is happening here. The same thing that's happening here is happening here. Especially because there's similar types of cells. It, too, looks, right? it looks similar. And so we maybe also, they're just different to separate the populations. Well, well, well I, there's actually, we have a need for doing this twice, and I'll talk about that need in a moment. And then, um, but now the question is, remember in, in uh, this example, the input to, uh, to this system right here was uh, going into layer four. So we can think of this like the sensory input right. coming in and driving this. Right. What's driving layer five? What is the, if this is equivalent to layer four, what's the driver to layer four? It turns out that the basic, this is one of the basic things in the literature, that if you look at layer two, three, it is the primary driver to layer five. Mm -hmm. All right? So it sort of says like this. We've got this one sensory motor system going on here. I have another sensory motor system going on here. In the input to this sensory motor system is the output of this sensory motor system. So this lateral connectivity, is it it's the no, same? No, it's right in the same column. Now we've got all within one column now. Uh, okay. We're just a purely oh, okay. one column. Okay. You want to? I think that's the right way to think about this. You just start with one column and try to understand what one column does. But, but I mean, this is also going out. 
Yeah, I'm but, but I'm, not those, I'm not drawing those right now. I'm not drawing those. Okay. Pretty much every neuron in the neocortex, every pyramidal cell, when it makes an axon, it has a local branch that goes locally, mm -hmm. and then it has a, and it splits, and, it, and often they go someplace else too. So just because there's a cell here, and I can say, oh, those cells are driving layer five, those cells can also be sending their output elsewhere. Okay. Right, so the same, same cell, the same axon that goes laterally splits and sends its a connection down here. Okay. So it's not inconsistent to say these cells project to here and drive layer five, so and at the, the same time they're projecting laterally someplace else. It's sharing object the object yeah, but I'm with its to, I'm other to, columns, but also I'm, with itself. I'm, well, I'm, I'm trying to stop thinking about sharing at the moment. I'm just okay. focusing on a single column. Okay. Right? I think that's the way to do it. If you start thinking about all these interconnections between these columns, it gets very confusing. If you can understand what a single column does, then you can explain why they do these other so things. So in that case, the input is an object. Well, to, the input the is coming layer from layer five. two, three. Let's say that, okay? Yeah. yeah. Here's what I actually think is going on. Okay. This is my best guess today. That's great. <laughs> I said there's two sensory motor systems here, right? There's this one between 6A and 4 and one between 6B and 5. Yeah. They're working on the same principle. Right. Movement, location, movement, you know. Uh, pooling. Can, pull, well, pull, no, the pooling's happening here. Okay. But in this case, it's, you know, this is uh, like a grid cell type layer, and this is the input layer, and, you're form and you can basically model, you know, your inputs in some location space. Right. Okay. Right. Um, it turns out that there are, there's a need in the brain, and there's evidence that this is happening, for why you have to have two separate sensory motor inference systems, but it's, it's a little different than you think. Um, one of those, think about, it's all about movement, movement and predicting your input, movement and predicting your input, movement and predicting your input, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a need, one of these, one of these systems is based on your location in space. Like I'm here and I'm going to move over here, and I've, you know, that's like a grid cell. I've changed my location. I move right. over here, I've changed my location. Right. There's another type of movement you can make, and that's orientation. Right. I can stay in one location and I can move left and right, up and down. My input's changing as I do that. If I'm standing here, I look up, I look down, I look left, I look right. That's a different type of sensory motor inference system. And um, it, it, and it can work on the exact same principles. What I think is going on, my best guess right now, and I give this maybe an 80% chance of being correct, is that this system here, this one here, 6A, 4, and 2, 3, is basically doing sensory motor inference over orientation. And this system here, layer 6 and layer 5, is doing sensory motor inference uh, over um, you know grid cell location X Y Z X Y type of location. Uh, th this is what we did. actually this is what we described in these papers. Okay. Um, Why are they swapped? Why do you think they're well? Well, uh, well, well I mean, I in these papers, when we wrote these papers, we did not talk talk about orientation. Correct. We knew there was a hole. We knew that we have to do with orientation. You we cannot, mentioned it, I think. But we, I, I, we might have mentioned it in the paper, but we didn't really understand how it's done. Yeah. If you look in the, um, the hippocampal complex, entorhinal cortex and the subiculum and the hippocampus, you find these head direction cells. The, and the rat knows which way it's headed. Those are right. orientation. Yeah. So you've got two, I, I call them two metric spaces. A metric space is something you can you can use you can move through and you it changes it, your it's basically it means you can right. calculate like I can say how many how many if I want to go from point A to point B how do I do that um, and one of these metric spaces is based on a, a, a rectangular grid coordinate system or, or uh, we would call a linear system it means like X Y and Z uh -huh. and the other one is a radial system absolutely right which is like yeah. orientation. Um, right. There are, those are two basic sensory motor inference systems that have to be accomplished. I can, I can model on my space around me by moving my head like this, and I can build a model of this room around me right now based on my one location. That would be the orientation sensory motor system. Okay. And then I have a different sensory motor system, which is when I move through the world to a new location. Right. Um, these are obviously have to play together. I cannot predict what I'm going to sense just by my location. The only way I can predict what I'm going to sense, I have to know my location and my orientation. Right. Even if it's a finger, if I'm going to predict what I'm going to touch on this, this thing here, I can know where I am on it and my orientation of my finger. Mm -hmm. I get a different sensation, but it's the same location in space. 
So there's a general, this is a general principle of movement that there are these two, it, it, it's true for your body, it's true for your fingers, it's true for your head, your eyes, that there was these two um, uh, metric spaces. There's a radial metric space and a linear metric space. And, and so you can think about it this way. This system is modeling um, the, po the place you are right now. And instead of 2, 3 being an object, what I in this new model, this new thinking, this would be equivalent to place cells uh, in, the, in the hippocampus. Um, you know, equivalent to place cells. Meaning, this is a stable represent. Place cells are these cells in the hippocampus that are stable, meaning they stay the same active position. If the animal's in one location, and independent of which way the animal's facing. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter if the animal's looking left or looking right. It's these cells are active. Oh. They, it's like oh, it's okay. like an object. It's like it's like this point in space right. is an object, and it, the object is independent of which way I'm looking. It's I'm defining this the object as a point surrounded by a bunch of things. Um, and so this is stable over movements of orientation. And that's what I need to predict. Um, that is what I need to predict my input. I need to know my orientation and my location. Okay. And so what I think is going on here, now you might say, OK, this is representing a place independent of orientation. It's like, OK, this is the, this is the features I'm seeing at this location, independent of which way I'm oriented. And then that is what you need to actually model the, the space around you. Yeah. You, you following that? I it's, think I'm following. I'm, I'm getting tripped up a little bit on the place cell thing because I'm thinking, okay, this is not just, this is not the object representation. It's, that, it, it's, it's a it, different type of object. It's not the one we've been referring to. Well, would you say that an object might have many place cell representations that might? Uh, let's, let's, yeah, let's, that's okay, okay. let's, if we talk about an object, um, uh, let's let's try to use the language of the hippocampus because it's easiest to think about. That's okay. like a room. Okay. So yeah, we're okay. trying to model this room. Okay. This is the object. The room okay. is the object. That's right. The yes. room is the object. Which which goes along with the two D object recognition project I've been working on. Okay. The room, the room is, the, is object. the object. Now I want to learn to model this room, and uh, I'm going to do that by observing the room. So the way we described it in our paper so far is like okay, I would know where I am in the room. I would have some sensory feature, and I can build a room by saying this sensory feature is at this location in the room. And if I go over here, I have a different sensory feature, like, like the coffee cup. It has you know, an edge here, and a round thing here, and a handle here, something like that. Right. But in reality, um, it's not so simple. I can't, I, at any moment in time, what I sense is depending on my orientation. Yeah. If and there I, were no way for you to turn, it might be that simple. If you constantly yes, all have right, the right. one orientation yeah. environment ever. Sitting in the room right now, which people can see, is, is, is Lewis. And Lewis, when he modeled, <laughs> when, there he is. Uh, when Lewis modeled this in the thing demo, yeah. at first we didn't understand this and we couldn't get it to work because the, to, to predict the input, you needed to know the orientation. So we, we cheated. We created sensors that were orientationless. Right. Um, but real sensors have an orientation to them. And, that, and that's how we're cheating, too, in the project that we're working on. Okay. So, I mean, cheating is a, it, it doesn't sound like, it, I don't want to say it's bad. It's what you do when you, you build up the complete model. Absolutely. So, we build a complete model. We said, here's a model of how we can learn objects using grid cells and, and input and object representation. That's great. We said it might be 6A4 and 2, 3, but we did that without a comp, a company or a, 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 accommodating the orientation. Right. We cheated by leaving out orientation. Now, if I'm going to leave in orientation, I think it changes things. I think that what's happening here is I'm modeling a, a place, a sensory motor inference of a place, which is really the movements are related to orientation. So right. in this case, I would say this is my orientation at this moment in time, which, you know, like three degrees of freedom, uh -huh. kind of like this. And I'm using, at a, a, a particular place, I can model what I'm going to see depending on my orientation. So I can literally, it's, it's almost identical to what we published. It's just instead of using a linear space, we're using a, a radial space. And so my movements are not going forward, left, and right. My movements are going up, down, left, and right, like that, you know. Yeah. So, so what do you, what do you, in this case, I'm assuming that in one position, imagine I'm sitting in one place, and I'm moving my head and my orientation, I see different things coming in, then I could say, ha, huh, I can model that place and say, given all my movements, I recognize where I am. I'm at this place in the world, in a particular room. 
It's like, okay, I'm at this place in this particular room. I know where I am. I haven't moved my location of the room. I've only moved my orientation. Mm -hmm. Now that I know my, I have a stable representation of my location, which is really what place cells are in the, court, in the hippocampus. Doesn't matter, the place cells say, this is a unique representation of my location in the world, and it's independent of my orientation. That's what place cells do. Right, they right. just mark a place, right. and they're independent. If the animal moves its head, the place cells do not change. Right. Mm -hmm. they, hmm? Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll run through and take some questions at, in a few minutes. If, yeah, uh, just if save want, them up in if chat. If you want to take them, that's fine. I'm not going to pay for you. Right no, now. I'm not interested in this right now, and then I'll go back and look at All the right. chat. So, so really, we have two sensory motor modeling systems going on. A, a radio one, which is basically modeling the space around a particular place in the world, uh -huh. and the other one, which is modeling structures based on linear uh, movements, x and y, moving around in the world. But the input to that is the place cells, in some sense. The input to that is the stable representation that indicates where I am. So this, is, this gets around the problem that Lewis had, where we had, where, it, you know, where we didn't want the input to the, to the modeling system to, to change as the orientation changed. So this is stable over orientation. Oh, right. On that, uh, in this, yes. it's, it's so stable. So what we <laughs> described as 6A4 and 2, 3 before as a circuit, the circuit's correct, but, uh, we, but I think what we're, we were using it to model the X, Y, and Z relationships of a coffee cup or some object. I think that's actually going on here. And what this circuit's actually modeling, the same circuitry, same basic function, is, um, is place. And so you have two of these systems. One is modeling place. A stable representation as I change my orientation, and then I can now move through space in an XY, you know, going forward, left, right, and I can now build up the model of the object. So this would be the model of the room, where each point in the room is a stable representation of a place, and I can break down that place into different predictions based on my orientation. Right. It's a two-stage. Um, but they form each other, right? These yeah, then one feeds into the other. The, well, we've got input to four, and then this to five. Yeah. So it's, a, it's almost like, it's like a, a cascading. This one yeah, first, this to that. then that, that yeah. one feeds into this. And, and then, then these two loops are continuously. Yeah, so two. one of these, if I, if, I, if, I, if I stay in one position, and I just change my head direction, this one's changing. Right. If I keep my head direction straight, and I just move forward, then this one's changing. Right. And if I do both, if I'm like walking forward and turning around like this at the same time, they're both changing. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, this may not appear at this point in time, but this is a very, uh, what I like about this is it's a very or, um, generic and orthogonal and powerful system. It basically allows you to create a sensory motor model of any kind of high dimensional object. Um, uh, and, and I never would have anticipated this, but there seems to be these two basic needs: uh, a, a linear movement, I mean, a, a linear movement and a, and a, a radial movement. Um, I still haven't quite got my head around why the world is like that, but it seems to be. And, and we see these type of cells in the hippocampal complex. Um, we see these two systems, parallel systems, in a cortical column, even though no one explained. You know, I think we're the only people who ever tried to explain what these things are doing. Right. Um, I don't have any end-up theories that explain why 6A and 6B connected this way. Um, and, and so you, now you see this nice parallel um, system for modeling. This completes the picture. It says you can explain how you can model rooms and objects with sensors that move in the space of those objects and whose also orientations change within um, the space of that object. Okay, great. I that is like that's a good that's summary. A, this is what I wanted. Okay, so this summary. this is one of my goals for 2019 is to write a paper that explains this. Um, <laughs> now to throw a huge monkey wrench in this, sort of. Do do, do you want to talk about the the thalamus and and how it affects this? Uh, uh, how you think it might be affecting this, uh, this system? I know you're still thinking. Outwards. This is very like cutting edge. Yeah. Theory, so <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it may be uh, incorrect, inaccurate, whatever. Well, okay, yeah. Does anybody want to hear that first of all? Before, because <laughs> I know, um, uh, I keep my my server keeps. I don't. I haven't really got this all the way. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, yes. They want to. Okay. Hear all right. <laughs> all right. So let's. We're going to add another level of complexity. <laughs> layer seven. Right? Yeah, it's like layer seven. <laughs> 
Here's a, a little section of the thalamus. I'm only going to show a little section that's associated with this column. Okay. Okay. The thalamus is it's egg-shaped structures, and um, but each column is getting. And what, what's going on here is that when when I draw when I when I say an input to this column, it goes here to these relay cells in the thalamus. This is the thalamus, and um, and then it comes out the other side and it goes like this. So in this scenario, the input to this column is coming through the thalamus. Right. The thalamus, and these are relay cells, which are kind of weird because they, they kind of imply that they don't do anything. It's like a, a single axon comes in and a single axon comes out, a single spike comes in and a single spike comes out. It's not like that, but that's how they talk about it because it does look like that at many times. We, uh, uh, Subutai, um, uh, uh, in collaboration uh, with the MIT researcher, uh, uh, what's your name? Uh, Carmen. Carmen Varela. Uh, Carmen Varela. Yeah. Uh, X MIT. They just they they have a. They, uh, I don't know. Did we archive it yet? I don't know. Um, the poster. Yeah. The, post? well, the posters be published. Yeah. Um, anyway, we have a theory that we worked on, which uh, talks about how these relay cells may be actually be able to multiplex and move things around. But let's not go there for the moment. Okay. Um, there's another thing on on the thalamus called the TRN, which is the thalamic reticular nucleus, which is the type of inhibition. And what happens here, this is really interesting. So from layer 6A, these exact same cells that are projecting layer 4, the exact same cells, they send their axons up here, but they also send their axons back to the thalamus. So let's, let's remind you what this is representing. This is going to represent an orientation. In this theory right this now, theory, as we've yeah. not published, but I'm just describing, yeah. <laughs> this is representing orientation. Yeah. This physical connection is well documented. So uh, our interpretation of what 6A is doing is novel, but the 6A projection in the layer to the thalamus is very well documented. Now these, these things coming back, there are numerous of these connections. So there's 10 times as many axons going this way as there are going this way. Right. So this is like- A, a lot of information coming out. Yeah, out. yeah. It's like this is a very specific uh, pathway going forward. Yeah. Is that my phone? I think so. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, but there's a sort of massive feedback, and so this is a very um, pointed one, and this is more of a diffuse projection back. Okay. And whenever you see a lot of fibers going back, what it tells you is that the state of this is being projected down here. It's like a, um, it's like a, uh, the population code matters. It's not like a one-to-one -one fiber. Like here, it's like one input, one output. Yeah. Here, it's like you know, I'm I'm projecting back. Basically, I would be telling the thalamus what my orientation is right now. Yeah. Right. Um, and this is not just this is not just an orientation. I believe it's actually a very specific orientation. I think it's saying my orientation at this point in this part of the world in this particular object. That's the way these cells work, right? Um, just like location is not just a generic location; it's a location in a specific object. Right. Orientation would be my orientation, specifically related to the to my particular to, point in the world. To some reference. My right my, my particular yeah. location right now. Yeah. So it's very specific. Yes. Um, and, and so why, what's going on here? Clearly these cells seem to be able to influence these cells. They, they project to this reticular nucleus, which, and they also project to these inhibitory cells near the relay cells. There's a complex circuitry going on down here. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, what might it be doing? One of the things that's always been associated with is a tension. Um, this is, goes back many years, decades, that the thalamus and the projections from the cortex to the thalamus seem to be somehow related to a tension. Mm -hmm. And one of those ideas, of sort of the searchlight hypothesis, is that somehow the cortex is telling the thalamus to restrict what, what I'm going to see. Like it says, give me a smaller part of the world, give me a bigger part of the world, something like that. You know, like yeah. instead of just this column, instead of seeing this much of, of radial space in the vision, might say um, narrow it down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or widen it up, something like that. Right. So it's like the searchlight, like you go from a broad light to a narrow light. Which you can do in your mind. You can focus on yeah. an object. Yeah, and yeah. like right now, you look at this whiteboard, and all of a sudden, like, like thing? look at this six. Yeah. Right? It's the same input coming on your retina. Right, right. It, it hasn't changed what's coming on your retina, but all of a sudden, you're seeing a six instead of just this picture. Right. And then you say, well, look at the little loop on the six. And, and, and I say, look, the loop's not even closed. And you can, you can narrow down and narrow, 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 narrow. Even though the same input's coming on your eye, you're, you're attending to smaller and smaller subsets of the world. So this signal could be uh, to tell the thalamus to narrow down. Well, it, let's just, just call it an attentional signal. Let's, okay. let's for the moment, let's give, give, give grins to that. And we'll say, OK, let's just call it's it. It's some it. input to allow this to do its job. It's, it's basically, somehow, it's modifying the input that's yeah. coming back in. It's, it's okay. affecting this. Yes, it's affecting that. That's yeah. clearly what it's doing, yeah. although there is no good theory about uh, 
what it is doing or this right. minimal theories. So now let's just think about this a bit. I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> you asked me to talk about this. I know. But it, it doesn't, by the way, this is getting pretty close to the complete thing going on here. I mean, there's other cell types and so on, but yeah. we're, getting, we're getting at the core of the matter what Econ was doing here. And this part of it, it's important. It's clearly an important, essential element, the thalamus. Um, every column looks like these things combined. Every single column in the cortex is getting input from the thalamus into layer four, and it's projecting back to the thalamus. It doesn't matter if it's a language area or a vision area or a hearing area, it doesn't matter. They all look like this. Right. So this is part of the, the, the big, you know, we're trying to figure out what a cortical column does. Right? So a double layer infrared system, maybe, this is a speculation, mm -hmm. orientation and location. Um, and, and why would the orientation be passed back down to here. So this is not passed back down to here? Not, no, it's not. It, uh -huh. uh, to make things even more complicated, um, 6B does project to the thalamus, but it projects to the thalamus someplace else. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it so, can't be that simple. <laughs> so it, it's only like, it, here's the difference. When 6B projects to the thalamus, it's projecting to the thalamus for somebody else's column. If wait, 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 for somebody, now many, we have to talk about many columns. Again. Well, well, I mean, Not many columns, imagine, imagine many. this, like, imagine this is a V1 column, the primary visual cortex. Yeah. 6B might project to the thalamus associated to V2. Oh, so is this a different type of cell? Is this it, a, it's, it's not It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't connect the same way as 6A connects. It doesn't go through the TRN. It doesn't go through the TRN. It's different. Okay. Just leave it as different. And okay. let's, let's not pay attention to it now. Okay. Because I want, to talk, I want to focus on what a single column does. And if 6B is projecting to the thalamus in some other part of the, the cortex, it's not related exactly to what this column is doing. It's like another voting mechanism. It's yes. another, right, right. Um, right. It's something else going on. Which I'm one ideas has occurred to me. I, I need an idea. So. Anyway, I want to focus on Clearly, this projection impacts this column. Yes. This projects to the loops yeah, right, right, right here. Right here it is. Right Bingo, right like that. Yeah. This um, does not. This one projects through the thalamus in a different way, in a different part of the brain, uh -huh. and it's more hierarchical. And so it's affecting the next guy in the hierarchy. It's not affecting this guy. Okay. So let's leave that out for the moment. Okay. And so now this is sort of our complete picture, um, uh, close to the complete picture of a single column. And again, I want to remind everyone that these two things are in the same column. <laughs> Right, right. So this is one separate. column. This, so we're just separating out so you can see the parallel construction here. Yeah. Um, so uh, I can't even add some more to this, but let's go back here. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about the thalamus. Um, the current thinking I'm having about the thalamus, imagine now um, um, we're in a room, right? And I'm trying to model uh, this room. And I have my location, I have my orientation. Right. And, um, and I see the camera up on the wall up there. Right. Right? Now, I see that camera from here. I can also see the camera from here. Mm -hmm. And in this place, it's closer to me or further away. There's, like a, there's, a, there's things that are going on. Things are scaling back and forth. Like, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're saying, I, can imagine, I can perceive that camera really close to me as a larger object. Yes. Or very far away from yeah. me. Yeah. So I'm... In some sense, I want to, for, for this orientation system to work, imagine I'm, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, this is a visual column, and I'm, I'm seeing things at different orientations to me. Well, I may see the same things. If I, if I stood here, I see the same things around me as if I see here. Right. The difference is, is that they're at different distances and different scales. Yeah. Right? It's like, it's not like I have a different... But when I open my eyes to look around, I know I'm in this low point. If I open my eyes over here and I look around, I know I'm in a different point position. It's not the same position. I know that. I know I'm here. I'm at this place, and I'm not at this place. Yet I'm seeing the same objects. Uh, it's a different. It's like I'm moving. It's like it's like these. It's like this is modeling the stars around me, and I'm moving some, in some point, other point in the galaxy, and the stars are shifting positions. It's something like that. It's yeah. the same stars, yeah. but they're kind of moving around. And so, so there's, that's kind of this weird thing that's going on here. I want to know where I am. This, this place remarks where I am. The actual features I see and the orientations I see in them are going to be slightly different depending on different positions in the room. Right. You follow that? Yes. Yes. Uh, excuse me, the phone's ringing. I'm going to, oh, uh, that's my wife. You want me to, I can pause it for a minute. Uh, one second. Yeah. Sure. Let me pause the uh, hey there. real quick. Okay, we're back. Um, 
So, very hand wavy map. We talked about this in the podcast the other day. Which will be out soon. <laughs> um, there, there's a, these cells, the location cells, uh, like the grid cells, the, there's theories about how they work. And one of those theories is that grid cells work on oscillations. Mm -hmm. um, meaning it requires these oscillations in the brain to, to, for them to know where you are and then to update where you are. So when you move, what you're actually doing is changing frequencies of oscillations and mm -hmm. then these cells know how to change their state. It's a complicated theory, very detailed, but it's inherent. This, that theory says in order to understand how grid cells work, there's this oscillation that's set up. And if you understand that, then, then it gives you the interesting ability you have the ability to change the scale of things by changing the frequency of the oscillation. Right. So it, from here. We, right. Yes. So imagine I, I say, here's my, I can write my name. I can say, hey, right, Jeff, right? But I can also write it big, right? It's the same motor plan. I, I, I'm playing back the same basic motor plan, but I somehow am able to scale it up or yeah. I can scale it down. Yeah. And so there needs to be a sense of scale in the brain. There's also, we do scale, we do it for physical movements. We also do it for, um, uh, for time. So I can speed up a melody and I can slow down a melody. Yep. And, um, and even think about radial movements. Now, I'm, I'm going to say, okay, I'm looking at your face. I have a model of your face and I'm moving from your eye to your eye and your nose to your mouth. I have to move my eyes a certain amount to do that. Yeah. If I stand closer to you, I have to move my eyes more. Yeah, yeah. You're the same person. The same object. But even the movements are different. But the movements are different now. I, I don't even notice this, right? You don't think about this. It's just when you're closer, I have to move more to achieve the same result. So I have a, I have a model of your head or face. Yeah. And to reckon, and I can I can determine how far away you are by how much it takes me to move between these paces. You also use the example of a very small object. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Take like, the coffee cup that we always I, If I gave you a child's um, coffee cup, a little one that's half the size, yeah. you would say that's small, but you'd still be able to use it. You'd still be able to make predictions about it. It's like, I can take the knowledge of the coffee cup and apply it to a scaled down version. Yeah. This seems to be an inherent property of time and space in the brain. The brain can do those things. Right. So that's what's, in some sense, what's happening when I move around in this room. I see the same objects, but their scale is changing. Mm -hmm. And I need to know how far away they are. And, um, and one of the ways I can find out how far away they are is by how much I have to scale to make the model work. So if I see the, the camera up there, um, oh, that's not a good thing. Maybe I'm just looking at the, white, the, the big projections, the big white, uh, the big screen over there. Um, as I move closer to it, it gets bigger and I refer back. And so, so knowing how far away it is is also basically if I, how much do I have to scale up or scale down to see that thing. Something like that. And that's not a part of orientation, that's a part of well, it's, space. Well, what, it, what I think would, could be happening here, remember, this is orientation at a specific location in the world. Yes. It's not just my orientation. It's not like, oh, 30 degrees west and, you know, whatever. It's, it's at a specific, go back and read the frameworks paper, and you'll see what I mean. The location signal is very specific. It's a location on a specific object, yes. unique to that object. Yes. This is really an orientation that's unique to this point in space. Right. And at that point in space, the scale I need to recognize things changes. Yeah. Um, versus the, a different point in space. And, yes. And, and right. I haven't worked this out yet, but the idea that. You mean like along the same orientation, moving forward or back. Yes. Away from you, you have to use imagine, a different Imagine scale this thing is. This model. thing is. Think about it this way. This thing says um, when I'm in some point. Have some place in the room. Hey, well, that's the location. There's a whiteboard here, and there's a screen there, and there's a door there, and there's a projector there. Great. I've learned these things. Now I move to a new location, and the size of all these things changes. Mm -hmm. And 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 as I look at it, the size changes. So if I were if I could say, okay, in this new location, I'm going to tell you to scale things differently. And now here, here's where this gets interesting. Oh, that's why you need there is a, there this. Is, hang on. Hour. Well, hang on. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. there, there are frequency, there are oscillations that occur between the cortex and the thalamus. This is very well known. Right. And so there's this, I'm, I'll just call it like, I'll just draw it like this, okay? There's these oscillations. And there are frequencies, you know, 10 hertz, something like that. Mm -hmm. boop, 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 you know? And, and the, the theory that I'm working on right now is that there's the, that, 
the, this oscillation between these two establishes the scale of things at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at this location and this orientation. And if I switch to a different orientation, I would have a different scale for the object appearing. Right. And if you're in a different loca location, I have a different scale. So every, at every point, remember, as I change my orientation, it's always unique to this location. So as I look at different, as I change my orientation, I can specify what is the scale of the thing I'm supposed to be seeing at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I rotate, what is the scale now, and what is the scale now? So you're talking about features in the object, which is a room. Right, yeah, so like what is the scale of the, the, the projector? What is the scale uh -huh. of the eraser? What is the scale of the table? These change as I, for any particular orientation, the scale is it's fixed. Right. But if I move right. to a new orientation, a new position, a new yeah. location, the same, or I'm looking in the same direction, the scale is different. Right. So these, um, this basically says at a particular location, I can specify what the scale should be for everything I'm seeing. Is that, it's, I know I think it's, these have to be learning together, right? I mean, the, the, the idea of grid cells and location and whatever orientation modules are happening here, they have to learn space together they do, yes, over, they do. over yes, time they for this do. to work. Um, there's, a, there's sort of an exception to that. Because movement's I mean, essential to that. Yeah, uh, yes, they have to learn together. They do. They have to learn together. This is all one integrated system. Yeah. It turns out that it's possible that I can have two places in the world that look the same but are on different objects. Uh-huh. And sure. we've seen this in rats, that if a rat is in a true environment and all they can see locally are, is identical to between those two environments, it can't it can't know which room it's in, right? So you get the same place cells. Right. So it could say, like, yeah, I'm in the, I'm in a particular location, it looks like this. Um, usually I can identify that uniquely. I'm in room A. Yeah. But it's possible to create rooms where the rat can't tell the difference and says, I can be room A or I can be room B. Yeah. So they learn together, but they're not always one-to-one -one correspondence between these two things. Okay, yeah. Um, I, guess, I, guess. I could have a, there could be another room in the world where I see the screen and the, this and this and you, mm -hmm. and I see exactly the same, but what's behind me is different. Right. So if all I can see is this, I can't tell where I am. Right. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. But they do, obviously, the whole, this, the whole thing is learning together. Yeah, it's all very fluid. You're moving through the world. These things are all changing rapidly, all at the same time. I mean, kind of, it's amazing how rapidly this stuff is changing. Uh, and as even you, as you attend different objects, the poolings are going to change as you move from. Uh, uh, well, well uh, yes. Yeah, so in this case, um, yeah. We're the, talking the, about rooms. Yeah, 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 yeah. The rooms, yes. As you move. Um, um, this is the one. So imagine, imagine there's these two pooling layers here. Um, I didn't, I didn't show the. Set. This is not the pooling layer. This is the input to this. Okay. Let's imagine there's another pooling layer, and, I, and I'm, and we'll just call it five A, something like that. Okay. Um, this is temple pooling. This is temple pooling. Okay. Okay. And this is outputting someplace, and this is outputting. Okay. <laughs> um, these are two stable layers. That's what temple pooling means. They're stable. Yeah. This is stable over changes in my orientation at a particular point in space. Okay. These are stable over movement in a particular uh, room. Right. Right? Which encompasses this. Yes. yes. So if I'm in the same room, this is always stable, and yeah. this could be changing all the time. Constantly. It could be. If, yeah. you're, if you're moving if your I'm, if, if, if No, if I'm, moving, if I'm moving around in the room. If I'm in, oh, right, right. You have if I'm in one location, one location, if I'm in one location, I'm doing this, yeah. this is stable and this is stable. Okay, yeah. Right? I'm at this stable point, I'm at this stable room. Right. If I move through the room, this stays stable, or and this changes. Right. Right? Because my point has changed. Okay. So uh, it's a sort of nested structure of sensory motor modeling of points in space and sensory motor modeling of um, uh, objects, uh, if you will. Okay. Uh, and I want to what I want to associate with the location on the object is the point in space. It's like this point in space is at this location on the object. It doesn't matter what my orientation is. It's that point in space. Yes. Right. That makes sense. This is getting this is this is getting very close to a complete sensory motor theory. Um, and the idea that and I, I'm sort of making it up as we talk here because I haven't really walked it through yet. The idea is that is that at any point in space, uh, you're trying to figure out what that point is, and you're seeing objects around you, but it's the, it's the scale of those objects is very important to know where you are. 
Yeah. I see the same objects at different scales. Yeah. You might think you're too you're really close to something if it shows up really big for some reason. Yeah. And exactly. That would confuse so, you. Yeah. So I know I can I can know how car, far away I am from that wall by the scale of the of the screen. Right. And and if I once I've learned this location, if I learn it, I may not learn it, but if I learn this location, then I will know what to expect there. Right. Um, so this idea that you're taking, a, you're, you're, you're basically building your model of location by, uh, uh, by what you observe at different orientations and the scale of those objects at those different orientations tells you where you are in the world. And what's, what I think is going on here is that this oscillation is changing, if this theory is correct, that as you, as you change your orientation um, uh, relative, uh, as, you, as, you, as you're different points in the world, there's different oscillations would be set up to say how big that should that thing be from here, how far away. You can think of the oscillation frequency as how far away is it. Yeah. Because um, how much do I have to scale to model it? How much and because I like to think about this as, you know, sort of an um, object modeling machine right here. Yeah. Um, and this can turn the knob on, if you're, fo if you're attending an object or imagining an object that you know, you can make it bigger in your head or smaller yeah, in your yeah. head. That would be happening here. Yeah. In the, that so I, what I was showing here is how we have to change the scale to just know where we are, to just right. recognize right. where we are, form a, um, a, a stable representation from my point in space. Yes. Um, I didn't talk about how that scale would affect motor behavior for like signing my name. This is more well, like it definitely would. It, well, it's going to the same basic principles going to underlie it. Well, this type, this meaning um, a scale of space and a scale of motion or movement. It's a, right, it's a scale. Time, of, this would be scaling. Uh, yeah. Um, we'll talk about this in the podcast. So when it comes out. Yeah. Imagine that this rep is these are grid cells, right? And yeah. these are orientation cells. So this is total deduced made up stuff by us, that orientation cells are going to do this. Going to Let's call this. it theory. It's a totally made up stuff. <laughs> yeah, <the> theory. <laughs> I, I'm pretty confident about it, otherwise I wouldn't talk about it. Right, um, I, I know. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty confident about it. So our theory is that orientation is working on basically the same principles as grid cells. Um, and these are just these are going to be driven by, by frequency, mm -hmm. and these are also going to be driven by frequency. And, and evidence of this is that there are head direction cells. Like we know that these cells in exist in hippocampus, but yeah. the idea that they're going to be most people don't think of them as um, similar to grid cells. They don't think of them as a, um, um, this idea that you could be modeling space with orientation, I don't think is, I think is new. Mm -hmm. And that these guys would have a sort of similar property to these guys, and they might work on the same basic mechanisms as these guys. I don't think I've ever read that. Um, so we're sort of taking what, what the, most of the neuroscience literature considers head direction cells as sort of its own little thing and grid cells are their own little thing, and they don't really see them as being the same. We're saying, they're the same. They're actually working on the same principles. It would be elegant if it worked. Yeah, right. yeah, and, and it's almost a requirement. I mean, once you get into this, it has to be like this. Yeah. So people get annoyed when I say that, but that feels that way to me. So, um, so the idea here is that you, you can also scale the whole room. I mean, I could say, here's a miniature, you know, I, uh, but we don't really like to do that, um, you know. I scale the things, as I see the things in the room, I tend to scale those, but I don't really like to see a room. If, if we act, they've done this with rats. If you took a room, the rat knows. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you shrink it a little bit, yeah. the rat says, okay, it's the same room. If you shrink it a little bit more, at some point the rat goes, nope, this is a different room. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, does it, I mean, this is like real time shrinking? The, well, they, yeah, they literally move the walls in. So the, so the place cells then have to like re anchor or something to define. Uh, well, they, place, what, uh, what happens is the grid cells, cells, cells re anchor. Re grid cells re anchor, that, is, that tells us the rat thinks it's a oh, room. Oh, that makes So we'll keep the same place representation because you're seeing, still seeing maybe landmarks, however, your grid cell snaps. Yeah, to it, something. it just sort of indicates that um, we, don't, we don't generally, we will notice when um, something shrinks. Yeah, we would. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ask Alice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will notice that. We will stop thinking like this is the same room, damn it. it really, it's smaller. It's not the same place. Well, that's similar. I mean, if you take an object, if you mutate it enough, even as you're observing it, you're going to create a new space to represent some, yeah, that. Sometimes at some you will. Point. At some point, I could change the coffee cup and you wouldn't notice a difference. Right. But right. at some point, I change it enough, you go, well, that's not the same coffee cup anymore. Yeah. Right. So the same thing happens in the rat in the room. But here's why I have this connection between 6a and the thalamus, because I have to scale this all the time. That's normal. That in this, 
in, yeah. in any particular room, in these different locations, I have to change my scale to see things. Every time you move radially, it could be a different, yes, it's it's, a different it, scale. Yes, it's, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. so that, I don't, what I see, instead of saying I'm in a different room, what I say, I'm in a different location. It's, the same, it's basically the same thing happening. Mm -hmm. Here, if I stretch the size of the room, I, at some point I go, different room. Here, if I stretch the, the, orient, the, 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 the scale of the orientation, mm -hmm. I say, ah, oh, I'm in a different location. All right. So I, if I look up and look around like this, I may not notice the difference in location. My, my, my play cells may be active, the same play cells may be active when I'm here and here. Yeah. But if I move over here, ah, oh, they're different, different yeah. play cells. Yeah. So again, it's a very parallel system. Um, but here, I'm constantly in different locations. I have to have a different scale uh, awesome. for the things I observe. By the way, doing this, talking to you like this is helpful because I've never really described this, tried to describe it like this. Uh, I've been thinking these ideas, but um, I've had sort of in the back of my head that this is what's going on. But this is great for me, I think, in the community who's in, in, certainly interested. Yeah. Uh, maybe we could stop and I could run, run through chat, see if there's any questions. Sure, if you want. Because I, I think this is about the end of where we can yeah. go with this. I'm going to move this Before going microphone. To, in the deep end of craziness here. <laughs> I don't, actually, I don't think um, this is crazy. I think no, I don't think it's crazy. I don't think it's crazy at all. We're here, but I thought you were crazy. <laughs> okay, well, we got a lot of chat here. Um, let's work from the bottom down. Um, I'm going to let you do this. I'm not going to look at you. Can sure. Uh, let's see. Confu oh, so here's a comment from um, Project Robbie. What confuses me is that there uh, is that are there orientation cells that represent the orientation of the object itself? So if you're standing in the same place, so we're, we were talking really about allocentric. You know, well, let's not use that term. Allocentric. Let's try to, uh, egocentric was what we were. We're saying well, in a room. Yeah, in, in a room. room. And and objects in the rooms are sort of like features of the room. Right? And, so let's put it this way. Imagine the world is composed of objects. And each object is composed of other objects at particular locations in, the, in that object, okay? Yeah. This room has objects in it, a table, a chair, door, whatever. Um, when I say the room is defined by this other set of objects at different locations in the room, the sub-objects all have an orientation, mm -hmm. right? Um, if, the, if the table was oriented different in the room, I would know that. Would, so, that be, would that orientation be in respect to you? No, uh, it's respect to the room. Just, to the room. just okay. respect to the room. I think that's a cool. Uh, uh, I have a particular orientation to things, but when I'm defining the room, the model of the room does not include me. Got it. Got the model it. of the room right. is just the room. Right. So I could say, uh, you know, a coffee cup has a handle on the side, and the handle is orientation is important. If it was horizontal, that would be a different thing. It would. Be. Right. So it's not just it has a handle. It has a handle at a particular orientation relative to the whole object. Now, the coffee cup itself doesn't have an orientation. Um, but if I embed the coffee cup in another thing, it sort of has to. Then it would have to have an orientation relative to the other thing. Right. So the question is does a room have an orientation? No. But does, is, is this room as part of our office have an orientation? Absolutely. Yes, it has yeah. an orientation relative to the office because it could have a different orientation relative to the office. Yeah. I could have it get 45 degrees, that would be a different orientation. Yeah. So it, the room itself has no orientation. But as the components of the room have an orientation to the room, the room has an orientation to the office, the office has an orientation to the building, the building has an orientation to the, to the town, things like that. I think that makes sense. Um, so let's see, orientation questions. Any other, anybody else have any last minute questions? I'm trying to go through, there's a lot of crosstalk here. I'm glad the chat was uh, um, active. Um, what I'll do is, you know, what I was, what I was going to do is use this as sort of uh, education for me for talking about this next week, but I might just use this as the content for next week because it was really good. <laughs> well, I think we got, the beginning was a little bit wonky, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, but I thought, well, as soon as we started focusing on this sort of two uh, sensory motor circuits, I think we're really getting at the core of it. All right. Well, I, I like the whole thing. So I think okay. I'm happy. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for watching this uh, Thank stream. you, everyone. Um, oh, did Jeff... Does Jeff still recommend that we have friends read on intelligence to catch up? Yes, of course. Uh, I look, I don't want to promote my own book. Um, I'll, I'll promote it. I think uh, you should read it. I think, look, it's an easy read, except for chapter six. And, um, <laughs> and most of the book is still accurate. Yeah. Um, and even today, I meet neuroscientists who say, hey, I read your book recently, and it was really useful. Yeah. So um, it still seems relevant.
Um, and it, it sort of gives you, it gives you sort of the very big picture about uh, how to think about the cortex. And, you're, and you are working on another one. So I, am, I am about 40% through a, a new book. And someone says, this feels like everyone has ripped off stuff from it. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, Who cares? It doesn't it's, matter. <laughs> We're <laughs> working on the future. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> it's right. We, uh, it's, you know, my motivation is basically is I want to know this stuff. Yeah. You know, if I could read someone else's description to tell me how it worked, I'd be happy. All right. So, well, people like the stream. Great stream. Thank you. Thanks, right. everybody. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, I'll see you later. I'll be streaming Friday at least. So, take care.